we're going to talk about slaves, servants, and saints tonight. We're going to just do a little bit of a Bible study. This is not a rip, snort, and uh, romp and stomp type of message. We're just going to study the Word of God. And that's always profitable, don't you think? We'll look at a couple of things. We'll look at uh, some descriptions of what slavery is and, and what servanthood is, bond servants. And then we're going to look at the saints in light of that. We're going to see Jesus as the supreme example of servanthood. <coughs> and we're going to see, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to see a, an example from Paul's ministry of Onesimus. We'll look at those things tonight. We're going to start by reading a, a couple of scriptures. If you want to join me in Exodus chapter 21, Exodus 21 and verse number 2. And then from there, then we'll go to Galatians chapter 3. But first we'll read Exodus chapter 21, verses 2 through 6. Now we're talking about slaves, servants, and the saints. In Exodus chapter 21, verse 2, as God was giving the law to the Hebrew people, He says in verse 2, If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, but in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be the masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges, and he shall also bring him to the door and unto the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. God regulated slavery, servanthood in the Old Testament. Now in Galatians chapter 3, verse number 28, Galatians 3, 28, and we're going to the New Testament saints now, skipping from the slavery of the Old Testament. And by the way, God didn't prescribe that they have slaves. He's just saying in that, that particular time, it was worldwide, everybody, well, all the known world, everybody had slaves. Every culture, every society had slaves. And so it was kind of like, it's kind of like divorce. God doesn't go around wanting everybody to divorce, but he did give regulations to make it fair. And he did that with slavery. Now in the New Testament, we read this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. He makes everything even at the cross. Now we'll look at one other passage in the New Testament before we begin the lesson. Philemon, the little book of Philemon. <coughs> Excuse me. In Philemon, look at verse number 10. <coughs> Paul is writing a letter to Philemon about one of his servants that had escaped. And he says in verse number 10, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Now the bonds there, Paul was, he himself was imprisoned and he won Onesimus to the Lord. And it says, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. Whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind I would, uh, would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. 
For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever, now, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So Paul's writing uh, the fellow that had, uh, had his servant to escape, and he's saying, now I'm going to send him back to you, but he's a Christian now. He's saved like you are, uh, Philemon. And so he doesn't need to be regarded as a servant, although he's coming back. But you don't need to regard him just as a servant anymore because he's brother in Christ now. Well, let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd bless us. Lord, help us to understand the scriptures and not just the terminology, but the deep concepts behind these things of, uh, of slavery and servanthood. Help us to just to embrace it for what it really means. I pray you'd bless us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, in, ser- in the biblical context, servanthood was rooted deeply in the idea of voluntary submission and humble service. And <clears throat> servanthood, to God especially, is to be out of reverence for God and love for God. And it's not something that, God is not a slave taskmaster. He's not a, a, a master as we might imagine in maybe in colonial America or some of the other nations around the world that, that held slaves in more modern history. Uh, there's a nobility of service. And God doesn't want us to be slaves as we might imagine in modern history in the 1860s and 50s, but God wants us to be servants willingly. Let's look at these things a little more closely. Uh, You can think about Abraham's servant. Anybody remember that? Abraham's servant uh, in uh, Genesis chapter 24. Abraham wants a wife for his son Isaac. And uh, he sends... uh, sends this servant, some people give him a name. I don't think it's actually mentioned in Scripture. But he sends his servant to a faraway land up to, uh, I believe it was Haran and Paran, wasn't it, up north, back where Abraham uh, had first sojourned in the beginning. He had some family up there, and he wanted, he wanted to take a wife for his son, but he didn't want to take one of the Canaanites. And by the way, there's a, point, there's a good point in that lesson right there. It doesn't have to do with this lesson, but... Uh, Parents ought to be concerned about who their kids marry. And uh, we ought to have some input into who they're going to marry. Instead of just saying, go out and have a big time and marry the prettiest one you find or the richest one you can find, uh, we ought to instill into our children from the time they're very small, you ought to pick somebody that's first godly. And, uh, and I told some teens, uh, sitting, they were sitting over here one time, and my wife was sitting with them. And I told those teen girls, I said, now girls, don't, don't just go out and marry a guy because he's handsome. You're better off to marry an ugly guy that loves the Lord than you are a handsome guy that doesn't love the Lord. And my wife said, he's right, girls. That's what I did. <laughs> she doesn't know when to respond properly. <laughs> we ought to know something about our kids. And so Isaac, or uh, Abraham sends uh, the servant up there to find, uh, and he goes a long way. I mean, he's got camels, and he's taking gifts, and he goes all the way up there faithfully. He swears to Abraham uh, that he's going to go up and find that wife, and if he doesn't, he says, "I'm going to try my hardest. If I can't, if the Lord doesn't prosper my way, if I don't find her, then then you're not going to hold me guilty for that, are you?" And so Abraham says, "No, you go up there and do your best. If you do your best and you come back without a wife, then you know we'll be okay." And so this servant, he had, you can't think of him in the terms like we do maybe in more modern times about slavery where maybe somebody's chained to the wall and maybe they get whipped and things like that that we've seen in movies and so forth. Uh, that Abraham's servant was not that kind of a, a servant. Uh, he, didn't, he had freedom to go hundreds of miles away and to hold his master's valuables as gifts to give to that prospective bride. And then he had freedom voluntarily to come back to Abraham when his job was done. So we're not thinking of some, some slave that would be beaten or killed if he escaped. Here's a, here's a servant who voluntarily gave his service to Abraham. He found the bride, he brought her back, and he kept on serving Abraham. So that's a lesson 
not in degradation and exploitation of some human being. We see this man was treated very well uh, by Abraham. And so then we can think of some other people in the Bible that are called servants. Uh, we, we see that Moses is called a servant of the Lord. And uh, Joshua, remember, when jo- after Moses died and Joshua brings the people uh, of Israel into the promised land, and Joshua is called a servant of the Lord. Now, he wasn't a slave. He wasn't, he wasn't beaten or threatened with death if he didn't serve God. He did it voluntarily. But he was a servant of the Lord. Now, I'm going somewhere with all this, so hang on. Um, in 1 Corinthians, let's look at this one together. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 22. I'm trying to lay out my case early in the lesson before we look at some of the contradictions to this lesson. But in 1 Corinthians 7, 22, I think you can see that in the, in the New Testament, <clears throat> I'm... I'm proposing to you that unlike a lot of the modern versions of the Bible and a lot of the scholars and even some of the lexicons who say that the word, New Testament word, Greek word doulos, many of them say it should be translated slave every time instead of servant. The King James Bible renders the word doulos servant many times. And of course we've got a lot of people who hate the King James Bible and so they, they say the King James translators just got it wrong. It should have said slave and not servant. You're, you're a slave of Christ. You're not his servant. That's what they would say and it should have been translated that way according to them. But I can refute that with several verses but I think this one will do the job. 1 Corinthians seven twenty two. it says for he that is called in the Lord being a servant is the Lord's, what's that next word? Free man. Now, free man's not a slave. And he says, likewise, also he that is called being free is Christ's servant, not Christ's slave. (coughs) And so, (coughs) the Apostle Paul recognizes that being belonging to the Lord. Now, are we bought with a price? The Bible says that we are bought with a price. The price is the precious blood of Jesus. But unlike an ordinary uh, slave that we would normally depict from maybe the colonial ages, we are not forced to serve him. He gives us a free will. And so a servant serves, maybe in a lot of ways like a slave does, but it's of his own free will, not because he's forced. Now John Piper, the famous Calvinist out west, He thinks that doulos always uh, should be translated slave. And again, they use, most of those people that claim that use a modern version where it is translated slave. And is the word doulos translated slave in some places? Even in the King James Bible, it is. It is. There's times when it means a slave, someone who is forced to labor without pay, And he has no opportunity to leave. He has to stay put. And so it is translated that way sometimes. But according to the context, and here's where our King James translators got it all right. They knew to look at the context and determine whether that word doulos meant slave or servant. And obviously belonging to Christ, he does not force us to serve him. We serve him because we love him. That's what Paul said. Paul said, I'm constrained by the love of Christ. Um, Piper also thinks that slaves were in better shape in the Bible days. He thought slaves were better off than servants. He recognizes that there was such a thing as servanthood apart from slavery. But John Piper says, well, those servants were more just like a hired hand. They lived in their own quarters, their own house, their own place. They'd come to the, to the location of the master and they would serve him just like working a job all day long. And when the day was over, they went back home and they had to provide their own food. They had to provide for their own family. They had to buy, provide their own housing, their own clothes. And so Piper says those slaves were a lot better off than the servants. <laughs> well, that, that's kind of ignorant, I think, that anybody would say a slave 
is better off than a servant. I mean, that would, that would be considered uh, an enemy of wokeism for sure today, but I can't imagine anybody thinking that a servant is worse off than a slave, where you can actually go home and you can even change your employers if you want to, where a slave has to stay put at the same place and he's forced to labor without pay. Does he get a place to live? Sure. He gets a place to live and gets, uh, gets some provisions, but he gets no pay, he has no freedom. He can't go out and he doesn't get any money. He can't go out and spend the money, even if he had some. So a slave, I, I find it hard that these scholars, that such smart people can say a servant was worse off than a slave. <coughs> some lexicons, a lexicon is a, it's like a dictionary, only it takes like the Greek word, <clears throat> takes a list of Greek words and defines the Greek words that's behind the translation, the English translation that we have. <clears throat> In a Greek lexicon, you can look up a word like doulos. Doulos is the Greek word for servant and slave. And so you can look it up in a lexicon. And there's oodles of lexicons out there, lots of them. But let me caution you about something. <clears throat> lexicons are not inspired by God. The Bible is. <laughs> and some lexicons say, yep, doulos is always a slave. Others say, nope, sometimes it's slave, sometimes it's servant. And you can find a bunch of them on both sides. But yet a lot of the scholars in, in uh, universities and seminaries will side with the lexicons that say it should always mean slave. Well, lexicons are not inspired, so it's like reading your dictionary. Some of the words in the dictionary may have a definition you like or dislike, but whether you do or don't, uh, that Webster's Dictionary or the American Collegiate, whatever dictionary you happen to be looking at, is not inspired by God. And definitions change. I've, I've seen it just in my short lifetime. I've seen English words where the definitions change. Well, just think of the word gay. Back in the 1890s, if someone was gay, that just meant they were happy and having a good time and happy-go-lucky. It, it was kind of a joyful cheerful word. Now it means something totally different. It means, has to do with somebody's sexual orientation. Well, so th those words change. So depending on which dictionary you read, you'll get di different definitions. And which lexicon of the Greek you read, you can get def different definitions. So slave and servant are not the two, not the same thing. They don't mean the same thing. And it, the word doulos shouldn't always be translated as that. For instance, in Grant, uh, Strong's Greek Concordance. Here's, I'll just read you their definition. Now this is the one that I think is more correct. And there's others. There's oodles of others that agree that doulos is not always slave. And Strong's is one of them here. He says, first, it can mean slave, literal or figurative, meaning it could be uh, figurative, just meaning like somebody is a, Slave to alcohol. Well, that's figuratively speaking. I mean, it's that, the, the bottle of booze doesn't have chains around them holding them in place. It's, it's, it's kind of a voluntary submission to the alcohol. I mean, somebody can quit if they really want to. And so then he says, going on further in the definition, frequently, therefore, in a qualified sense of subjection or subserviency, bond... And servant. So he clearly gives the meaning of doulos that it can be translated servant as well as slave. Now, sometimes a slave, I mean, you could say a slave is a servant, could you not? A slave who is, I mean, he's captured. He can't go anywhere. He doesn't get paid. He's forced to work for nothing. And so he could be used as a household servant. He's still a slave, so he could be both. But there is a distinction technically between the two. And the reason this matters, and we'll get to it in a little bit, you say, well, why such a big ado about nothing? Well, it's not about nothing. It does matter, and we'll see that in a little while. Jesus Christ is the ultimate servant leader. <clears throat> Somebody look up Mark 10, 1045 and read it for us. Mark 1045. <clears throat> and we'll see Jesus in his divine status. Somebody else look up Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Who'll do that? Somebody got Mark? Rod's got Mark. Who's got Philippians? Somebody do Philippians. Brother Paul's got Philippians 2, 5 through 8. <clears throat> 
<coughs> we're going to see Jesus in his ultimate servant leader role when he ministered on earth through his life and teachings and sacrificial death on the cross. Uh, we see Christ exemplified the true essence of servanthood. Read Mark 10, 45. He came not to be ministered to, but to minister. He poured his life out. He poured his life into his disciples. He poured his life out unto those who were diseased and sick and deaf and blind and lame. He poured out his life for others. He was the son of God. He came from glory. He could have lived in glory, even here on earth if he'd wanted to, but he chose to be a servant. And so how can you see a better example of servanthood than somebody who didn't have to be a servant, but he chose to be. That's what Jesus did. Now, Philippians 2, 5 through 8. So Jesus, the very word servant is used of Jesus there. Now, if doulos, the Greek word, should always mean a slave, then that verse would say Jesus came to be a slave. Now, does anybody really think, does anybody really think Jesus was a slave? I mean, Jesus went all over the Holy Land. He went around performing miracles. He did all kinds of stuff. He slept wherever he wanted to sleep and he went wherever he wanted to go and nobody forced him to work. So it wouldn't be correct to call Jesus a slave. He was a servant, voluntarily serving others. And so that one passage in itself shows, <coughs> like did the one in Mark, that Jesus was not a slave and servanthood is different than slavery. Jesus came to be a servant. Paul's message to Philemon, we, <coughs> we read it, <coughs> excuse me, we read it there at the beginning. The runaway slave, most of the commentaries will say. Now whether he was a bond servant, a bond slave, or whether he was an outright slave or ordinary servant, uh, he was probably more of a bond servant uh, to Philemon or he, Paul wouldn't have felt like it was necessary to send him back. He, had, he was under obligation. But <clears throat> Paul shows that anybody, no matter how much in servitude they live, when they're saved, they are free spiritually. And so his master Philemon was to recognize him as a brother, not as a slave to a slaveholder. So let's, let's uh, apply this. Uh, for you and I. I mean, this is what we want to get out of it. Listen to this. We ought, as Christians, to embrace not slavery, but servanthood. We ought, as Christians, to embrace servanthood. As Jesus gave us the prime example himself, and he said unto his disciples more than once, he said, the, the one that will be greatest among you, let him be your servant. It is greater to be a servant of the Lord than it is to be a master of a whole host of slaves. Being a servant, voluntarily giving our service to the Lord, not because he's going to beat us up if we don't serve him, not that he's going to threaten us with death if we don't serve him. We who are saved have been liberated and we ought to embrace servanthood saying, Lord, because you freed me, I was a slave to the devil, but you freed me with your blood. When I accepted your blood, I was made clean. I was freed from the devil. The chains were broken, and now I'm free, and I'm free to serve you. And that's the attitude that Christians ought to have. That I want to serve him. In 1972, NASA launched an exploratory space probe and it's called the Pioneer 10. Uh, 
And his mission was to reach Jupiter and photograph Jupiter and its moons and do a little bit of exploration, test out the magnetic field and all of that. <clears throat> and scientists thought this was a pretty bold plan. Well, it was back in 1972. It was pretty bold. I guess it would still be bold today to think when you come to think about it to send this Pioneer 10 to Jupiter was a big job. And they didn't think, the scientists didn't think that it might really happen, that it would get there because it had to pass through an asteroid belt. And they thought, boy, the asteroids are going to beat this thing to pieces when it goes through there. And it's going to get destroyed before it ever gets to Jupiter. But it did reach Jupiter in 1973. And the immense gravity of Jupiter, when, it, when, the, uh, when the space probe got close to Jupiter, it started to go past Jupiter and the gravity of Jupiter. Jupiter is a big planet. It flung <laughs> that Pioneer 10 with its force of gravity further into space. It passed the planet Saturn. <clears throat> at about a, mil, a, a billion miles from the sun. And then at two billion miles, it passed, hurled past Uranus. And then at almost four billion miles, it passed Pluto. <laughs> this thing's going a long way. It's way further than they expected. And uh, they thought if it made it to Jupiter, it'd be great. But now this thing just going billions of miles. It just keeps on going. And <clears throat> Pioneer 10 was, in 1997, Pioneer 10 was more than 6 billion miles from the sun. And despite that immense distance, we're talking about billions of miles through space, the most remarkable thing that they're saying about it is that that thing still stay, it was still staying in contact with Earth with its radio signals coming from an 8-watt transmitter. <laughs> the 8-watt transmitter on that Pioneer 10 was equal to about what, if you've got a little nightlight in your bedroom, <laughs> that's, that's about 8 watts. And this thing is sending signals from 6 billion miles away. It takes it 9 hours for that radio signal to get here. Nine hours, but a little eight-watt transmitter was doing the job. Unbelievable. And when we offer ourselves to the Lord in servanthood, sometimes people think, boy, I, I don't have anything to offer the Lord. I don't know how to preach. I don't sing. I, I don't know how to teach a class. I, I can't do this or I can't do that. Nothing I can do. You know, I'll just sit and listen. But yet when we offer ourselves in servanthood to the Lord Jesus, it's kind of comparable to that 8-watt transmitter. <laughs> Who would have thought that little transmitter could send those radio signals through billions of light, uh, billions of miles through space and get to earth? And who would think that anybody like us could serve God and do anything of any magnitude at all? Little is much when God is in it. It comes with surrender. When we surrender to be a servant, God doesn't ask us to be slaves. I don't have to serve God. I don't have to. I can rebel. I can say, I'm done. I ain't preaching any more sermons. I'm not going back to church anymore. I'm doing nothing. I won't tell anybody about Jesus. I'm not going to have devotions anymore. I'm done. I don't have to serve him. You know what? That doesn't mean, now he could if he wanted to, but it doesn't mean he's going to kill me. But because I love what he did for me, and I know he loves me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that's sacrifice. Jesus came to be a servant. Because of what he did for me, I want to serve him. I want to serve him. I may be an 8-watt transmitter, <laughs> but I want to serve him. And however far, my, however far my little radio signal will go, I want to use it for him. Servanthood. We're not slaves, but we can be servants. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd bless us in a wonderful way. Help us to decide in our hearts that...
that you're not a mean and spiteful God who conscripts his children into the service of slavery. We know you're not that kind of a God. You do love us. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us to just relish the fact that we're able to be servants voluntarily if we choose. Thank you for your love. I pray you'd bless us. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed.